Good morning. Kind of comes into what we're going to be talking about, like that faith bank. Like, what's your faith bank look like? Like, when you're thinking of some of these struggles, these circumstances, and these issues, like, I couldn't imagine uh, my, my fellow officer, my friend, that his, whose son was battling an RSV, and he's in the hospital, and he had to be sent into the city. So knowing that your child, one, has to be transported to another hospital, and then... You know, all these other different things and circumstances and maybe funding, maybe physical funds are an issue for you when you're thinking of, like, i got to take off work to do this and do that. Man, there are so many things that can tap out our faith bank. When you think of the bank where we throw our money and we put all that stuff, and then I'm trying to, I want you to kind of for the next couple weeks, next three weeks to think about what is your faith bank like? Like when you think of when you go back into that bank to write that check for that for that thing that you're chasing, that career that you're going after, that school you're going to go to, where's your faith at? Like what, what, what's, what's, your, what's your level at? What's your account look like with God? I'm not talking about an account that's got like a checklist of all the wrongs and stuff. I think I'll cover that today for us adults. But I want you to think about like for our little guys, like Goose, how do you know when you come off the school bus that mom's going to have snacks and food in the house? How do you know? You don't know? But there is, isn't there? Isn't there always snacks at home? And mommy always, <clears throat> and mommy's got like dinner, she, she cooks up something good for us. We always got food, most of the time. Be careful with that one, don't want mom right behind you. Right? But you guys have faith in mom, right? You know that things are going to be at home. Things are going to be at home. You're going to, you're going to come in, the house is going to be warm, you're going to have food, you're going to have water, you're going to have... <clears throat> your toys, all that stuff. Because you believe that mommy is going to be there and have it for you, right? Sometimes daddy. Sometimes. I try to do my best. <clears throat> this is going to be bad. I can just tell already. I got my water. I put it right here. But you think about that. You guys don't know that mommy's going to have that. You just believe that mommy's going to have that. How do you know that God's going to be there when you need him? Isn't that a crazy question? What do you think, Goose? Because he's always there. Amen. Faith of a child. <laughs> right there, you can't. I did not train my son to say that. <laughs> so if you didn't hear that and you're watching online, he said because he's always going to be there. That is what God tells us throughout Scripture is that you need to have a faith like that, that you know that I will always be there because it's the faith of a child. As simple as that sounds, that's the faith that our children have in us. You may, as a parent, have the worst day in the world, but your babies still count on you because they believe in you. Mm -hmm. Not because of what you've done, but because of what they believe in you. That's what God wants for us. And so that's my thing. That's what I wanted you guys to know, is I want you to remember that. And then uh, Paul writes this letter in this scripture that I'm going to share with your moms and dads. It says, uh, for him, for from him, through him, and for him, all things... To Him be the glory forever. To God be the glory forever. We get things because God is good. Because God gave us Jesus. And it's because of Jesus that we live through Him. And He does good things for us because of Him. Because Jesus is awesome. Goose, you are awesome. And for the record, when we were all setting up, Asher was sitting here looking at my Bible, pretending he was preaching. So... <laughs> I always say he's the crazy kid, but who knows? He might be up here one day. But I'll let you guys go back with Miss Kendall. And now they're going back and they'll be wild. Faith bank. Faith bank. You really can't make up that response of a child. And and I, I could honestly just sidetrack and push this whole sermon into the trash can and just go off what Asher said because... Jesus continually tells us that you have to, to believe you have to have faith like a child. And when we, I think as we get older, the worse it gets. The more we get uh, calloused by the experiences and circumstances that we've experienced, uh, that we don't see God show up in our everyday life. We don't see Him show up and provide for us. We don't see Him in the mess. And we only want to look at Him, honestly, as we get as to adults. We only see Him when it's good. We don't see Him when it's bad. But like when you think of our children, they see us in our good and our bad. And they see us even when they have made the worst decision of their life. They still want to hold on to their mom and their dad. Like I've made some choices as a, as a young man that I'm 
had very important conversations. I've had to face my children, but it's never, or my children, face my parents, but it was never, I don't think I've ever been fearful to face my parents. I was nervous of how they would perceive or what they would say, but I never doubted what they would feel about me or what they would think of me. I've never doubted the lack of love in my family, but that's, that's what God is. And I know that's not the same for everybody. I know that there are some of us that have had experiences where you went home and you, there was a lack of love. There was a lack of commitment. There was a, you know, but that's where, that's a whole nother sermon to talk about. Like, listen, we're not perfect. I'm not a perfect dad. I have terrible days. My, my children, this is how bad I can get sometimes. My children can pick up when today is not the day to talk to dad. Let's go past that. It's not a good thing. I got to fix that. But my children have picked, they're old enough now that they pick up on that. Or they know that give dad about 45 minutes, get that coffee in him in the morning. And then, then you can go ask me some complicated questions. You know, like it, it, we all have that moment about us, but it doesn't change the way our children think. Honestly, if I look at my own experiences, with my own babies, I can tell you that oftentimes it's the things I say and the reaction that I get from them that, that I know, right, that they know that I love them. Like, because like, even though I discipline them, the best thing that can fix that moment when they've disappointed me is a hug. And they know that it's, it's okay. The dad, that's what, that, that, that's what this is all about. As I have that faith bank so stocked up, so stocked full, that even when you do screw up, you know that you can come back to him and he's still going to be there. The account didn't lessen. He didn't wipe it clean. He didn't check it out. It's still there for you to tap into and for you to get into and for you to be sustained and provided through and for it. It's just awesome like that. The Lord, it's, when you think of the faith bank, and I'm, today I want to start talking about like divine credit. <clears throat> We're going to spend the next three weeks talking about like credit. <clears throat> or sorry, faith, like a bank, faith bank. I want you to start thinking of your faith like a bank. Maybe you came in here this morning and that faith has been depleted. Like it's like you're tapped out. You've been maxed out. It's, it's been, every day is a struggle. It's, uh, we were having a conversation about uh, uh, our young Hannah this morning and some of the struggles that our teachers and Aaron are dealing with. And like, <clears throat> we're only not even halfway through the year yet. And maybe some of their banks are just, the, the tank's getting a little low right now. Like we're counting down two weeks till Thanksgiving break and then we got Christmas break coming and then we're gonna be ready for spring break and, and then we're gonna be ready to kick them out of school. You know, <laughs> so I keep going with that. You know, and, and ultimately it's, I speak a lot about the educators because I get to see, uh, uh, be around them a lot and I get to see the struggles that they experience, but also get to see the joy. Like, listen, nobody goes into education for money and, and there's a, there is a love to be around youth, but there is the struggle when they're there. And ultimately it's a, it's a war of attrition. Like you get tired, like, and you see that as the year goes on and they get tired and, and ultimately there's things you can control and things you can't control. Like... You can't control home training. You can't control what happens at home. You can only control what happens in your room, but your kids, unfortunately, bring everything with them. And so sometimes that faith, that, that bank of yours is just, that tank is empty. Maybe that's you when you came in here. Maybe it's a, maybe figuratively it's for real for you. Maybe that bank account for real, the money that you need to live is really low right now. You know, I think of folks that we've been exposed to for the past couple of years since we started Focus, uh, some of the areas that we've chosen as, a, as an entity to focus on, and seeing how there are so many people that don't have anything, that don't have anything. Like, <clears throat> my goose knows when he comes home that there's going to be food. But what if there's some kids that are going home that don't have any food? Or what if you're a parent that goes home and you don't know what you're going to make? Like, you, uh, you have no idea how you're going to make it, how you're going to sustain it, how you're going to keep the lights on, how you're going to get the water bill paid. Like, uh, like maybe you're there. Uh, we kind of, as we wrapped up last week and we were talking, like, I don't know why your race is different than my race. All I know is that we're all in an endurance race. And some of us are meant to be on this path and some of us are on this path. And, and, uh, but never lacking or that, that faith to understand that God is in control of all that. Now, some of your decisions may have got you on that path, on that race. Yeah, maybe you made that decision to walk that path. And so this is your race and you're running that race. And that race ain't easy. And you can't deny that some of the, the two choices that you made have put you in that place. And then some of us have circumstances that we necessarily didn't choose. Maybe we were born into them. Maybe, maybe uh, <clears throat> our employer made that decision for us. And, and maybe, maybe some of us need to take control back. But nonetheless, you know, we're all in the, 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 What I'm getting at is the biggest problem that we find with our faith bank is who we give the credit to. 
and and I really struggled honestly as I was trying to process this thought because I was, divine credit would not go away. It would not go away out of my mind as I continued to prep. And I was thinking, what are you trying to tell me about credit and the, the faith bank and trying to make it practical so that we understand? And what I started realizing is like when you think about your credit for. Think about the credit that you use on a daily basis. Credit basically is saying, I got this. You know, it's basically saying, like, I got this. Like, you're telling somebody that I got the credit to purchase said item. Like, I got this. It's there. Trust me. I got it. You as an individual are trusting the bank that it's there. Right? So, so the entity is trusting that the money is in that bank that you just presented that credit, right? And that they're going to get their money's worth. You know, I, I, I think that here's the thing. When you think about your faith bank and, the, and that, that idea of divine credit is our faith bank tumbles and gets low because we take the credit for it all. What I'm saying is every time we have a success, every time we do something good, even though you may be a good Christian person, person you kind of get a little, little puffed up about it. Like I did that. I did that. I helped that person. I did that. I, I conquered that. How often in your life can you say that you've taken credit for it? I'm not even going to say that. What, 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 about, what, what, what about the things that you did wrong? Now, some of us will say, I don't want to take credit for that. But unfortunately, I will say that many of us that keep our faith bank so low is that we do take a credit for a lot of those things and we hold on to that credit. Like we never pay that off. God said, I already paid it off for you. So I need you to let it go. I need you to cut that credit off. But the thing is, a lot of us take credit for it all. And so we get stuck with all that credit. We get stuck and we are way back. We are way back logged in. We can't catch up on the payments. We can't keep it up. We can't. And, then, and you never will. And that's what I go and I'm getting at is to the Lord be the credit. It's his credit. To the Lord be the credit. It has nothing to do with us. It has nothing. We, we get so confused. We're many, we just drop off. We get confused and we get lost because we take the credit for it all. Good and bad. We take the credit for it all. And we can't get, we can't get out of that mindset. Credit in what we've done, good and bad. Credit in what we, we've earned. Like how many of us, like, I earned that. A lot of us put a lot of emphasis on our status and stature in life and the things that we have and what we got. Like, I earned that. This is mine. And we show it off. And it's like, I got all this. Right? Or how, credit and how we look. I know a lot of guys that put a lot of effort. And I'm not saying, please be healthy. Scripture tells us, be healthy. Because, we're again, we're running an endurance race. I encourage being healthy. I really do. But how many of us put so much into how we look? Like we put on this fake facade of awesome neatness and, and how great we look. And, and we put a lot of emphasis on that. And, and, it's, and then in that reflection and that image that we put onto the world, yet on the inside you are, you're rotten. Like there's nothing good about you. How about that credit and how we live? The stature and the style and how we live. Or you're so outdated. Not in you, honey. You know, I'm so... <laughs> you get like all this stuff. We try to take credit for it all and it pollutes everything and ultimately it's depleting our faith bank. <clears throat> we try to take credit for our, our performance and all those different areas that we were just talking about. And often we, we believe that that performance, that stuff right there, all those things I was talking about, determines our peace. See, our credit determines our peace. Does that make sense? Like our credit determines our peace. And all those different things, what we earn, how we look, how we live, determines our peace. And if you're anybody that's been in the Bible, does that, does that sound like anything that Jesus Christ ever spoke about? About your peace? No, he said, my, your peace is in me. My peace will be your peace. Lord, I don't know if you know anything about your peace, but you like got beaten. You got slashed on the back. You got thrown up on a cross. You got stabbed in the belly. Like, listen, there ain't no peace in that. My peace will be your peace. The Jesus didn't wasn't born into a, a family of stature. He was born into a, a working class family. Jesus wasn't wasn't celebrated and thrown up on on by kings and stuff. They hunted and wanted to kill him. Even the religious leaders that he came to be their Messiah to save them to teach them. 
<coughs> cast him aside. His own neighborhood, like his own home, Nazareth. Like they turned him away. He couldn't perform any miracles there because they didn't believe him. You want me to have your peace? Listen, your credit wasn't even good in your hometown. Like, why do I want that credit? Right? I mean, that. <coughs> this is what it was. But we, it wasn't about performance in that credit. It was where his faith was coming from. It was what his faith was tapped into. It was, his bank wasn't in the world system. His bank was in the heavenly system. That, 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 I mean, think about those struggles that you're having right now. If you would just realize that the credit is not yours. The checks you are writing are not yours. This isn't a sermon series on, although we will tap into talking about giving and tithing and what you have and what you don't have. But what I'm saying, if you realize what you have is not even yours in the first place, man, it makes giving a heck of a lot easier. Because then you realize right off the bat that, you know what, everything that you have is on loan anyway. It's all credit. But it's a credit to God, not you. And so Paul tells us in Romans eleven thirty six, he says, for, for, for from him and through him and for him all things, to him be the glory forever. For from him, for from Jesus and through Jesus and for Jesus are all things. To him be the glory forever. Doesn't say anything about you. Doesn't say for Ben, for Focus, for Charlestown, for the United States. It says, for him, through him, and for him, all things. All things. To him be the glory forever. He is the reason. Everything is about his glory, not ours. <clears throat> so when you have little and you have much, it doesn't matter. It's all his in the first place. It's all his in the first place. We live for him. We live because of him. We do because of him. Like if you could really, if, you're, if you were tap into your faith bank and realize that the actions and the steps that you take, if you evaluated everything in front of the cross before you did what you did, you would think about the decisions you were about to make. You would think about the steps you were about to take. You would think about the conversations that you were about to take. You would think about the words that were going to come out of your mouth. You would think about what are done in secret and you would think about what's done in public <coughs> because you evaluated it to the cross. <clears throat> My goodness, I should have brought some cough drops. I wasn't coughing like this at home. I started to settle down a little bit. <clears throat> we do because of him. At least that's how it's supposed to be. That's how it's supposed to be. That every day we go out, it's supposed to be because of him. We, we, we do the things that we do because of him. We're in the positions that we're in. Your occupation is not because of you. Honey, it's because of him. He put you there. He lined up those circumstances. He put those people in your life. He's got you on a path because that's where he wants you. I love talking to kids who said, man, did you, like, just like, people that are fascinated with law enforcement, like, you always want to be a police officer? Like, no, I didn't want to be a police officer. It's just like an opportunity of chance. Like, I, I had a, a child at 19. I was working for the city of Charlestown digging ditches. And I was like, man, I'm, God, like, I'm meant for more than this. Like, I, and I was not, I mean, I was, I love God, but I just wasn't really seeing God and, I didn't have the faith like Asher did at that point, like I wasn't, wasn't asking God about, but I was looking for, I needed, I needed health insurance. You want to know why I came a cop? I needed health insurance. Right? I need good health insurance. And I needed something different. And so, like I found being a policeman. And I think about, like when I told you I had that awakening and Jesus woke me back up and he's like, man, he, he took away the fog from my eyes and he unplugged my ear and he really softened that heart so tears would come out whenever he says to cry. You know, like when I think of that moment, I start looking back and you can see where God showed up every time. Every time, and I didn't even know then that he was there, but he was. And he, he put me on this path of 18 years of being a policeman. The first six of them were probably not very good ones. They, 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 they changed who I was. They, they, they uh, morphed the way I saw the world. But then when God woke me back up and the experiences that I've experienced have only equipped me for what I'm to do in the future. I don't even know if I would have found my way to, to, to seminary or dug so deep into the Bible had I not been a police. See, 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 there are things in our life that God taps into us and puts us in and circumstances, again, your race, so that you will find him. Some of us are hardheads. Some of us are hardheads. So he, you, you complain and you whine why you're going through this right now because maybe you're hardheaded. Maybe you're calloused. And he's like, listen, I'm telling you right now, 
You can make your life easier if you'd like, if you just be more of a servant than self-serving. Because listen, he will fight to the day that you leave this earth. He will not give up on you until you take your last breath. And the only reason he gives up on you then is because there's no more time. Other than that, he will keep fighting. He will put you in as many valleys as he needs you. He will attempt you. As, he, will, he will, every time you're tempted, he provides that door and that way out and you make different choices and you still don't choose him, but he still keeps knocking at the door. He wants to knock on that door and he wants to come sit at your kitchen table and he wants to have a conversation and, 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 and be in love with you. That's what he wants. And he will continually and continually do that. We look at some from a distance and we think how beautiful and marvelous their bank accounts look, but we never saw the journey that they went through. And I'm not saying that all those with lofty bank accounts are God-loving and God-fearing people. I'm not saying that at all. Uh, listen, the, the deceiver works in many ways. He works in many ways. But my bank account is not filled with the, with the dollar signs. My bank account is filled with faith that my God will give me enough for what my God wants me to do. What I'm more concerned about with my faith and my bank is do I have enough to love my children? Do I have enough to love my wife? Do I have enough to love my family? Do I have enough to love my community? Do I have enough? Do I have enough? Do I have enough to love myself? See, a lot of us need to get to that point. We give so much out to everybody else that you forget about you. And if you don't take care of you, who's going to take care of you? Sick can't help sick had that conversation with somebody earlier in the week. Sick can't help sick. You have to be healthy to help somebody get healthy. I love Christians that want to go out there and be a helping hand and do the right things and, and help people regain their footing and, 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 and find their way to Christ. But you can't help somebody if you're not healthy. I'm not saying perfection. I'm saying healthy. Healthy still means you may be dealing with it, but at least your focus is healthy. Because yeah, the scars and the things that you've witnessed and felt that have uh, dipped your bank account here and there and your faith account has gone down, those are the very things that's, that Christ will say, listen, I need, you, I need you to dive back in there right now because I need that right now because she, she over there, she needs that. She needs you to use what you've experienced and she needs to know how you got through it. She needs to know how you cashed that check that day for me. It's like, that's what he wants from me. He needs those things. He needs us to be that. You know, we, so to, to get even to realize that you even have a bank account, because some of you are like, listen, I don't even have an account with God yet. I don't even know who he is. Listen, you do. You just, you, you're a trustee. You just don't know it yet. You don't realize that there's an inheritance for you to obtain because you don't know that Jesus has already written the check. And he said, listen, you are already an inheritance. And Paul, I've continued that for him. <coughs> now, if we are children, then we are heirs. We are heirs of God's and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his suffering in order that we may also share in his glory, we are heirs to a promise. We are heirs to a promise that he will work through us, that he will be with us, that he will provide for us, that he will give you peace, he will give you joy, he will give you rest. I could, I could list off all the promises that God has for his heirs. He will give all of that to you. That is what is in your faith account. He will give that all to you. Kind of goes back to what we had just finished with a letter to the Philippian churches that if you just ask, if you just ask, if you would just ask me, I'll write that check. If you just, just, just ask me and I'll, I'll give you rest. You may not like my rest. You may not like my rest because I may ask you to change jobs. I may take what you've done for years, but I'm going to give you rest. I may have to put pause on that project you're working on right now because I need you to have rest. You asked for it. Or I may do this. See, sometimes when God intervenes and he does the things that he wants to do, that's the thing. We want to take credit for it. We don't realize that God did it. And God did it for a reason. And God did it for a purpose. And God had to get you where he needed you to be. And that's why, again, it's such a strong statement and I love my son for even saying it because it wasn't even part of today. But like, that's why he says you have to have faith like a child. Because faith like an adult sometimes is hard to grasp because we can't seem to shut off our minds to the world and the problems that tomorrow brings rather than just think in the moment, listen, okay, you got this. 
I don't know how you're going to do it, but all right. Like, God, I'm telling you, ain't nothing in that bank right now. So I don't know which, where you're pulling this from, but okay. Or how does taking my job give me rest right now? Like, I don't, like, that's not, not I'm not feeling you. Right? I, like, that, that, those are the things, but we want to, we want that, that false security, that false sense of control. Like, we control it all. The, the most freeing thing and most peaceful thing you could ever do is realize, listen, I ain't in control of nothing. I am absolutely not in control of nothing. And that's not just because I'm a husband. And that's not just because I'm a man. I'm an absolutely not in control of anything because I'm a son of his. He plans my steps. He plans them. And when you can tap into that and you can understand that, it, 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 you can feel that faith bank start to grow. Because then it's not determined by what I do. It's already been determined by what he did. And it doesn't matter what I did yesterday or what I do tomorrow. He is the same then and he will be the same tomorrow. He, will be, he was the same back in the past and he will be there. He was in the beginning and he'll be in the end. He will be, he is the alpha, he is the omega. He will always be the constant in my life. He will always be the center. He will always be the focus. And if he can remain the center and the focus, that perspective will just grow your faith. It will grow your faith. All this is what he has promised. Is what he has promised. Because he is who he is. He is your God. We can't always see those promises. And this is where we problem. We can't always see the promises. So a lot of us, we doubt God's credit. You ever think about that when you talk to folks that really don't know God? The hardest step for to get somebody to believe in Jesus, to, to love God, to, is that whole idea of surrender. But it's like, listen, I can't see God. I've never seen God. Ben, you ever seen God? Well, I can't tell you I've seen God. I mean, I've seen God show up. Well, have you seen God? I mean, yeah, they don't get that. They don't understand. Like, I've seen God move and I've seen God work and it is the most beautiful, awesomest thing I've ever experienced. But no, I'm asking, have you ever seen God? Have you ever seen an angel? And that what we do like as adults, as you get like as you as you get older, like you gotta see more stuff. You before you um, purchase a house, you definitely gotta go in and see it, right? You gotta inspect it. You have an inspection done to make sure it's good. You wanna you wanna make sure that everything's legit and everything's right. That we take that into our faith world too. Like we have to see it to believe it. And seeing isn't always believing. But that's the world we live in. We doubt his cred. We doubt God's street cred all the time. I mean, I still do. When God puts me into situations and he's like, I'm telling you, just do it. Just do it. Do it. I'm like, no, do it. No. Do it. Like God will keep saying, uh, we're down in Charleston. A simplistic thing, not asking for glory. I'm just saying like, um, this actually came, I, I, I've watched a previous pastor of mine do this all the time. And I remember like, wow, that just blew me away. Like it's because again, I'm a cop and like my, my worldview is tainted at times. But I came across, uh, I was with another uh, coworker uh, not a police officer, but somebody from education. <clears throat> and they're walking down Charleston. And unfortunately, in Charleston, West Virginia, there's a lot of people that don't have a lot. And as you're walking, fellow stops, uh, ask, you know, ask us for a meal, ask us for money or whatnot. And I stopped, had a conversation with them, I gave them some money. But how many of us, how many of you, how many times have I done it? I remember the first time I saw Pastor Mike do it. I was like, what is he doing? Is he giving a dissertation on who God is and what the gospel is? Like, I was, we were trying to get somewhere. But you know... That when you stop for the least of us, that's when you do the most for God. Like, it's in those moments that that might, there, right there might have been an angel of God. Like, can you in that moment think that as me and the, this coworker and I were walking down this, the street together, that God put me on that street for a reason to make sure that that man had a couple dollars in his pocket so he could go get a, a cup of coffee and a, and a warm meal? Or, how many of you are diving back into that check account bank account, you accountants going down your little ledgers. Well, how do I know he's going to go get a meal with that? I mean, I can't, I can't earmark that for a meal and I can't earmark that for uh, what account that's coming out because I can't guarantee where it's going and how it's going. Right? 
Don't we think about that sometimes, especially when we go to work and we work for people? And like, how do I know if I'm like nice to them, if they'll return that to me? Or if I do commit and give all my time to work on this project and I give them my best, and, and then all of a sudden they use it, they, don't, they, they take all the credit. You doubt God. We doubt God in those moments. We doubt God's street cred. Like he says, I'm just saying you do it and I got you. You just do what I've asked you to do. You do, you know, God, do what I'm asking you to do. Malachi, the last, uh, the, the, the last book before we get into the New Testament, I love this, and they, they use this scripture a lot speaking on tithing, but I want you to think, uh, broaden your horizons a little more as you hear it. But bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven, pour out so much blessings that there will not be room enough to store it. The whole tithe into the storehouse. A lot of pastors will use this and we'll talk about like, listen, just entrust, entrust us and trust the church and trust God with everything of yours and, and test him in this and see what he will do with what you've got. I don't really want you to focus on that as much. I just want you to get to the point that he wants you to test him in this. <clears throat> he wants you to test him in this. You hear me? He wants you to test him so he can show you what he will do with your little. I will take your little and I will give you much. We may be small, but you never know how many seeds that this will sprout. The opportunities of seeing somebody in the street, that opportunity that God, again, if, if you truly have that faith that you believe that God had planned those steps for you in that moment before you were born, then you know that that is an opportunity to plant a seed. That's why I love, I, I actually, uh, I got to go, I volunteer sometimes and I've actually haven't done the greatest job, Miss Rhonda, of being there uh, for teen court because I'm a busy life, but I love serving in teen court and, and went to teen court and I actually stayed extra, a good time extra, uh, even though I wasn't feeling the greatest. Um, um, and we were doing a court case and so I let them, I sat on the stand and I let them ask me questions and then they were having a lot of fun with it, so it developed into other questions and just asking basic law enforcement just questions like kids would ask. And uh, one of them asked that uh, that one why like well, why do I work in the school like am I a rental cop like they're I mean they're listening they'll ask all kinds of crazy questions. It's like no I'm a real cop, you know. But um, and I told them that I choose to work there because I enjoy being with I enjoy working with kids. I enjoy taking them. I told them that I said I get to maximize my opportunities because I get to serve you because I get to work with you is what I told them. And then they asked me um, if I, I wish I could remember what kid asked me this, but one kid asked me, he says, hey, do you ever see yourself in us? Hmm. Wow. That's a pretty heavy question for a kid to ask. And I said, you know what I do? I said, not every kid is meant to have a dose of, oh, I think I said, try to kind of lighten in the mood of the real Sergeant Williams. I said, but there are moments where there are opportunities to share some truth so that you know that there's possibilities. Not to be like me, but that you can do good things. Because like a lot of the kids that you see uh, that we hide in this community is that, 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 that there's a lot of kids that don't have a lot. A lot of kids that lose hope. Our, our youth on a general aspect just have no hope. They don't know where to go. There's lack of direction. There's lack of focus. There's lack of purpose. And if you take the opportunity to listen to them, you'll hear that. And, and, and if you can show them and at least plant some steps. I mean, that's all I hope to do is, is help them follow some steps, to help them follow some process or not even just that, but <clears throat> to not lose hope. Listen, you can be anything you want. But you got to work for it. The excuses of your past, stop using them as excuses. I can't tell you how many times I tell kids, stop using that as an excuse. Well, my mom and dad, I stop using that as an excuse. If you want it, go get it. <clears throat> this world will give you nothing. You got to go out and get it. Now, not everything's meant for you. I won't hold that from you, but you might find something in the process of getting there that might lead you to here. <clears throat> I, went to, I went to college. I tell them, I went to college. I quit college the first year. Came back, told my parents I quit. So now I had some other circumstances. Some kids need the dose to realize that, listen, that some of the choices we make aren't the best decisions. I had a kid, had to make an adult choice. <clears throat> some kids, I give the dose of reality that, listen, if you statistically look at that, that choice in itself, that doesn't happen a lot in today's world. I said, but I had a support system. You know, there, there are kids, but that was a really powerful thing. Like, what if... Flip it on you, especially those educators in here. What, that some of these kids may be looking at you thinking, do you see yourself in us? 
Why do you do what you do? A lot of them look to, to us and like, and now if your faith bank is, is tanked and it's just not there, they can see through that too, that you don't have enough time for them. And that's huge. Same thing if we got our kids. If they realize we ain't got time, and I'll, I'll admit, and my wife will challenge me, and I need to hear it. it really stinks to hear it, and really, I will tell you it really irritates me, and she's looking right at me, but it's like, I make time for everybody else's kids, but I don't make time for my own kids. I need that call out sometimes, because I do. Because not that I'd not value the kids that I work with, but that's my job. Like, I work real hard, and the only way to make those connections is to make those investments, which we're going to talk about investments next week, as I make those investments so that I can get those returns of seeing those kids be successful. But if I'm not investing in the ones that carry my blood in them, then what good is the investments that I'm making out here? So I have a partner that will call me on that. And I'm going to be honest, Mom, so I don't respond very well to that comment. But I need that call out. I need that call out every now and then. But it's, it's test God in this. Test God with what you've got. Step out of your comfort zone. I mean, so if you're, how do you test God? How do you test your bank account with God? Let me ask you this. Are you reading scripture? On a daily basis, are you doing devotionals? On a daily basis, are you getting some reminders? You know how easy it is to, to pick up your phone, download the Bible app, app and just simply read the verse of the day and how much difference that might make for you hey and then maybe a month later challenge yourself to start doing a plan by yourself and then maybe a year later after you find some comfort in that start reaching out to some friends and do a do a thing together Carrie and I are doing right one right now and I'm so pumped because she started it and then sent it to me and I'm like really excited and you know it's a moment for us, not together, but to share a plan. And then, because in those plans that you do, you get to share comments with one another and what you thought about it. Like, those are things. Let me ask you this. Are you praying? Are you testing God through your prayers? How can you test Him if you're not talking to Him? What good's a relationship if you're not talking? I mean, that's a relationship. Are you speaking to him? Are you talking to him? He continually says, ask me. Ask me. Ask me. Listen, when you want it and you don't have it, test him. God. You know how many times I test him about this stuff, like with focus? I test him all the time. And right when I get to the point where I'm frustrated enough, he gives us something awesome. They tell this is why you don't need it. Just this is my time, not your time. This is my plan for you. God, I wish you would tell me what is good. But I can only trust him in that day. That's a day at a time. We just keep moving. Are you connected to God? Not only through your scripture reading, through your prayer reading. Are you really truly connected? Have you committed to connect into a body? Are you part of the church? Is it here? Is it somewhere else? I don't know. Is it a group of uh, friends and people? Are you connected? How do you expect to keep that bank account and have the faith of a child if you aren't connected to like-minded people that want to see you and help you and hold you accountable and push you and guide you? You got to have that in your life. You, it's, it, seeing isn't always believing. But if you put yourself in a position where you're continually reminded that you're not alone and that he is there and he is here, that he does care, that he wants a lot for you, that he has everything in store for you, that he's already planned it out for you. That Listen, we walk by faith, not by sight. Just because you don't see it doesn't mean he's not there. Sure, I've prayed for things. We'll talk next week. But I, one of the coolest miracles I remember the day, the last thing that typically, getting into the money side of this, the last thing you typically ever give to God is testing Him with your money, is giving Him your money. It's the last thing we ever gave to Him. It's the last thing. Gave my heart to, my, to Him, gave, gave my life to Him, gave all that to Him. But the last thing that I signed over to God was my money. Truly was the most, one of the most rewarding things once we did, because then I stopped caring about what I brought in and how important my job was because whatever was in the account was his in the first place. But I remember that wasn't as difficult for me because if you ever talk to carry money, it doesn't mean anything to me. Like I care less. I don't even know what to make for a living. I'd have a roundabout idea. It's a shameful thing. I know I'm an adult. I know I should. Matter of fact, my kids punked me the other day. I said, Dad, you remember you? mom told us that you used to do a checkbook. I said, yes, I did. I used to pay my own bills before I met your mother. Like, I'd do a checkbook. I used to go to the bank too. I knew how to do it. 
no, nah, I got a wife that absolutely loves money, not to the point, but that, that's her like that's her thing. Like it's like give me a cabinet to organize, not the bank account. I don't like I'll organize a cabinet, I'll organize a house, I'll organize a dresser, a drawer, anything that I can like like I can do those things. But I remember that when we finally gave that over to God, like I put that into Carrie's hands and I said, Listen, that was coming to our one of our Christmas offerings at our church that we were at. And I said, listen, I think that God's calling me to give more than what we gave last time. But I'm going to say, I'm going to give that to you. It was our, our above and beyond offering. And I remember that she made that tithe. And she gave, so we do our normal stuff, which we had already conquered as a family. But now we were tapping into the extra. And I was like, I think that we need to go big. And I remember she went big. And I remember when she went big, she came to me and said she wanted me to show. And I was like, I don't want to do it. Because I had already been there. I already conquered that. That wasn't a thing for me. This was her thing. And when she did it, I remember that we, like, for what we had given, God returned it. And I'm not saying that's how it works, but we got an insurance check that very week that fulfilled what we had just given. And I'm like, trust, test me. Test me in this and I will show you. Test me. I got you. Like, we test God's street cred all the time. And he's like, I'll, listen, test me and I will show you that I've got it, that I will do this. I mean, it's kind of like this. When you were young, remember when you were in college? Remember? I know it's a long time for some of y'all. Not me. I mean, it was, it, was, it was a long time ago, but not as long as you know. Remember you had that card and you stuck it back in the day. You had to go to the ATM machine to get money. Like, very, very rarely carry money anymore. Like, it ain't a real thing anymore. Actually, I, I had to go to the bank to get $10 out because I got to give a friend $10. But, like, you got the card and you went to the bank account and you stuck it in the machine. See how much money was in there? Like, it, that was like a gamble to see if there was anything in there. Especially in my young 20s. Like, man, I hope there's something in there. You know, there wasn't the whole Venmo thing, like, call my money, money. You know, but it's like you stuck it in there. Like, you never knew. It was like, that was a faith encounter in itself with the ATM machine. Why did you think or why did you know that there was stuff in there? Like, what? what? We pull these things out and we lay these on tables and we pay for meals and we pay our bills and we, we go places and we, we have this little plastic thing that we believe is going to pave our way and give us what we want. We can't see the money. But you hope it's there. Matter of fact, you can't see it. But for some of us, at least in our stable side of our life, we know it's there. God says, like, listen, when you're in those moments and you're having those problems, get in here. Present that to me. Pray to me. Like every time you pray, it's like sticking that card into the ATM machine. And it's even more so like you were 20 because you don't know what you're going to get back. Stick that card in and you don't know what's going to register on the machine. You throw that prayer up to God into that bank, the, the prayer ATM. You don't know what he's going to throw back at you. Sometimes he's going to give you more than what you asked for. Sometimes he's going to give you just a little bit and say, hey, just hold on. I, got, I need you to wait a little bit longer, but I am here. I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you a couple little reminders that I'm here with you. We got a little ways to go to fight through this, but we're good. Then sometimes we go into there and he fully gives you what you need. And then there's sometimes you go in there and he overflows you than what you have. But the bottom line is that you went to that prayer, you went to that prayer ATM in the first place. You went back to that faith bank and you put the card in and you made the investment. Not because you could see what was there, but you knew what was there. Because you know that he's always there. You've got to believe to know, not know to believe. I tell my kids this all the time. You don't have to know, you just have to know. You want to learn anything about faith? It's not about how much you know. It's just that you have to know. You just got to know him. I know that's so confusing and convoluted, but I just learned through seminary that as much as I tried to, to learn and I switched my major from theology, which is the science of God and how to do all these things, like we can search for all these answers and trying to find everything, but listen, you don't have to know. You just have to know. You simply just have to know that you are an heir to the promise, that you have an inheritance that you are entitled to because he said you were, because he sent his son for you and he gave everything for you And he will work through you to get you to him. He will do it for you. 
you just got to get to the point where you surrender. And I am running so far out of time, but you've got to get the last part of this. Hebrews 11, our faith heroes, it says, it says, now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. And there I encourage you this week, read this chapter. It talks about our forefathers and mothers that went through so much and did so much and just tapped into that faith bank, didn't know what they would get, didn't know what to expect, but yet they did it. And they did it because they were confident. They believed and they knew that the checks that they were writing would be backed by the bank of God. Like God said he would do it and I believe he will do it. So we will take the steps and we will make the investments and we will continue forward. Now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance. We make we move in faith. Our faith is confident and we, and we have hope in that. And then it's not even just like you hope sometimes for us as human beings. It's like, I hope, I hope it goes well. No, 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 no. Faith is confidence in what we hope for. It's, having, it's being confident that what we hope for will happen. Assurance will. It will come to be. It will happen. This is what the ancients were commended for. They believed their invisible prayers, their invisible hopes, all their actions, everything they did, the stuff they did in secret, behind closed doors, the things they did in the world, they did all of this invisible to visible. Nothing stopped them. They had faith that was confident and hopeful and they knew that if they did it, he would pull it off. All these people, this is at the tail end of it, all these people were still living by faith when they died. When you read through Hebrews 11, you'll see that some of them didn't see what they wanted. They wanted and wanted and wanted. They prayed and prayed and hoped and hoped and they continued to move in faith and take the steps and the actions and do the things that God had asked them to do, yet they didn't receive the prize that God had said would come. Because God didn't intend that for them. You may be praying so hard for something and wanting it so bad, but it may not be intended for you. It may be intended for your children. It may be intended for your children's children. It may not even be intended for your family. It may be intended for a whole bunch of other people. Abraham led a nation. Abraham never went to the promised land. That's one of the most, when you think about a man that made an investment, a lifetime investment, like how many, how good Christians sometimes towards the end fall off because you're like, I've done everything you've asked me to do, God, and you still haven't given me the one thing I wanted. Because the one thing that you wanted is not for you. <coughs> All these people were still living by faith when they died. They did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcome them from a distance, admitting that they were foreigners and strangers on earth. People who say such things show that they are looking for a country of their own. <clears throat> if they had been thinking of the country they had left, they would have had opportunity to return. Instead, they were longing for a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. These were all commended for their faith, yet none of them received what had been promised. And since God had planned something better for us so that only, that only together with us would they be made perfect. See, some of the times that we put so much, we again, going back to us wanting to take the credit, <coughs> the credit is not ours. The credit is his. We're on borrowed time when we live here because this is not what we were meant for in the first place. We are heirs, we are children, we are sons and daughters of God that will eventually return to God and we will be living with God and communion with God and connected to God on a daily basis. Um, it, it will be the most amazing, awesomest thing ever. But can you get to this point where you believe God and all his promises that like God wants you to have joy? God wants you to have peace. God wants you to believe that he will have you through everything, that God will be with you all the time, every time, everywhere, all, no matter what you're dealing with. Like he will be there. And it's not based on you. And thank God it's not. Because if it was based on you, think about the things that are going through your mind right now. The person that you loathe. The revenge that you're seeking the hurt that you're still carrying. Because he said, I, I, and the, before Jesus, that wasn't acceptable. 
But because of Jesus, if you just surrender that to him, he says, listen, it's gone. It's clean. Come with me and I will give you rest. Come with me and I will give you peace. Your peace will be my, my peace will be your peace. All these things. This is what God, God is not ashamed to be called their God for he has prepared a city for them. He has prepared, prepared a place for you and it's an inheritance to be received and all you have to do is just believe. Just believe. How do you get to, to belief? 1 Corinthians seven seventeen, the foundation of this church. Live, obey, love, believe. Live the life that you're given. Obey the God that loves you. Love. Love. I, as I love that Paul says love is after obedience because love is not a feeling. Love is obedience. Love is obedience. It's not based off how you feel. If you do it because you do it. Because that's what a Christian is. God, we, are, we are full of God's love. God is love. And then belief. If you can do those three, belief is so easy. But you gotta conquer those three. It is your inheritance to receive. That bank account will never go empty. That credit will always be a line of credit if you receive. I love what Genesis, the book of Genesis says this. Abram, who will eventually become Abraham. Abram believed the Lord and he credited it to him as righteousness. He believed the Lord. The very man that he believed the Lord. He left his home to, to travel and wander. He, he prayed for a son. He got a son. was called to sacrifice a son. God stopped him from sacrificing the son. All be, he just believed God. Believed God. Now he had some short fallings. That's the great thing too about Hebrews 11. If you go back through it, the hall of heroes, the hall of heroes were a hall of failures too. Like it's beautiful because that's what we are. We're human beings. None of us are God. It's not in what was his circumstances. Wrapping up with Abram. It wasn't, it's not in what it was, like his current circumstances, his current account, but what was to come. Abraham never got to see the promise. He never stepped foot into the promised land. Never got to see it. Never got to go. Got to see the borders. But he believed in what was to come and, and it never wavered he never stopped he just kept going and kept going that's what god intends for all of us back to the beginning i could have just stopped in the beginning do you have faith like a child and just believe let me pray for you heavenly father thank you so much for today thank you father for for bringing us into to, here today thank you for uh, giving us enough energy to to come in here and and speak your word and hear your word father Father, thank you for little Asher. Father, help Carrie and I as parents to continue to, to raise him and to fill his heart with your joy and with your awesomeness, Father, that he will somehow not lose that faith in you that you, you just will because you're God. Father, I pray that just that little statement will say more to you than anything that you spoke through me today. I, I pray for those of us that are in this room right now that heard that statement and for those that will watch this later will understand that a little boy said that he just knows you will do it. Father, I pray for those right now whose, whose, whose faith bank is, is so low that they're tired, they're worn out, they're stressed, they're depressed. Father, I pray that their focus is on you. Nothing that somebody else may say, nothing that uh, a self-help book will fix or some TV show or some doctor or this, but Father, not that any of those things are bad, Father, but I pray that they will just look to you first. You plan the steps. Father, help us to recharge our bank accounts. Help us to put more faith into your credit that you have done it before and you will do it again, that you were the same God then, you will be the same God now, and you will be the same God in the future, that for those that you provided for then, you will provide for now. You've been healing, you've been curing, you've been speaking, you've been bringing into communion, you have been connecting, you have been building, you have been uh, healing wounds and, 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 and creating fractures where they needed to be. Father, you have been a, a hand in all of the things of this world. Father, help us to see that. 
Father, you are amazing in all the provision that you've provided for us. Father, I pray that we can start seeing you in our everyday lives, that we can start seeing the places that you've showed up rather than being angry at the places that you were not. Father, I pray that we stop looking past our circumstances and realize that you are there. Even though we think you're not, you are. And some of us are experiencing the things that we're experiencing right now because you're trying to get our attention, that you're trying to get our focus back in order, that you're trying to get us reconnected, that you're trying to to challenge our trust, to to get our faith bank back in order, to trust you, to, to put our credit in you for the things that you've already done. History's already been written. Help us to fight and run our race. Father, you are amazing, and we love you, and we serve you, and thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.